It's now my great pleasure to introduce Professor Felicia Huppert, our keynote speaker today. Professor Huppert is internationally renowned for her work on the science of well-being and the promotion of human flourishing. Her research examines the causes and consequences of well-being across the life course using data from large population samples, longitudinal cohorts and intervention programs such as the Mindfulness in Schools project. Felicia spends part of the year in the UK where she's Director of the Wellbeing Institute at the University of Cambridge and Emeritus Professor of Psychology. She advises the UK government and international bodies on the measurement of wellbeing and on policies to enhance wellbeing. Felicia has obtained degrees in psychology from the universities of Sydney, California, San Diego and Cambridge. She has recently been appointed to a professorship at the Institute for Positive Psychology and Education at the Australian Catholic University in Sydney. Professor Huppert's action research includes controlled trials of the effects of mindfulness training for students in secondary school. This research aims to establish the benefits of mindfulness for a range of outcomes, including mental health, well-being, social relationships and academic performance. There's so much more to say, but I will actually stop now and welcome Felicia to the stage. We're delighted you're here with us today. Thank you. Thank you. Well-being and the measurement of it, it is a very big topic. Um, <laughs> And I'm going to begin the same way that Julio began, with the way we've done it in the past. So traditionally, well-being was measured using objective indicators. Uh, quality of housing, kind of education, marital status, uh, and of course the big one was income, uh, spending power, economic growth. And it was done in a very benevolent way because, of course, the origins of modern uh, economics uh, were that the economists wanted the greatest happiness for the greatest number. But because they didn't know how to measure happiness, they looked for a proxy for happiness. And they decided the proxy for happiness is how much you had to spend. Because, obviously, if you had more money than what you needed for your basic needs, you would spend it on the things that gave you pleasure and, therefore, you'd be happier. Obviously, right? But we now know that doesn't quite work. Um, uh, so just this is some data from the UK, but very similar data in other parts of the world. So we're looking at, yeah, thank you. Sure. Yeah. We're looking at um, gross domestic product uh, over a, a period of about 40 years in the UK. And uh, it's been doing this going up and up and up, except for the GFC when, when we've had this downturn. Now clearly, happiness, life satisfaction, however we measure well-being, should follow the same trend if the economists are right. And here's what we find. Flat lines. There is absolute, there's a complete disconnect between what's going on in the economy, what's going on in well-being. And uh, I, I wanted to give you some uh, Australian data. This was provided by a, a very distinguished colleague in Melbourne. It's just over a five-year period. It's before the GFC, but the same sort of thing. You see the G GDP per capita going up steadily uh, and the measure of personal well-being, again, flat. No relationship. So we need to think about well-being in a different way and one of the most exciting things that happened just a couple of years ago was the UN decided to address this issue and the UN had an extraordinary meeting. I was very privileged to be there and chair the session on measurement. Uh, and there were many great um, Nobel laureate economists, uh, Joseph Stiglitz and others, Martin Seligman was there. Um, they defined a new economic paradigm. So a paradigm that prioritises sustainability and what they call true abiding well-being and happiness. And the two do go together because how could we have a high level of well-being now if we knew that for our children and our grandchildren we'd have depleted the resources to such a degree that their lives would be miserable. So the two um, certainly do go together. Although today I'm going to focus more on the sort of the personal s side of well-being. So we have a challenge. How do we measure well-being? Those objective indicators don't work too well. And anyway, what we're really interested in is not the facts of people's lives, but how they experience their lives. I mean, we know perfectly well that there are people who live in very fortunate circumstances from an objective point of view, but whose lives are very unhappy or empty, unfulfilled. And of course, conversely, many people who, um, who, who don't have a great deal in terms of material possessions, in terms of income, and yet might be flourishing. So there is 
uh, this disconnect. And what we do need to measure is people's experience of their lives, not their objective circumstances. Um, now there's another reason that we, we need to do this. And, and large studies of representative population samples show that only about 10% of the variation between people in their level of well-being is attributed or attributable to these external circumstances, only about 10%. So of course it would be wonderful to improve that 10%, but it's much more important to understand the 90%. Where is that variation coming from? And science, of course, only progresses um, with good measurement, and it takes time to work out what the good measures are. So um, in the case of, uh, let's say, the health sciences, there's still debate about what's the best measure of obesity. Um, I know Julia could tell us much more about it, but you know, is it body mass index? And if so, which cutoff should we use? Is it something else, waist hip ratio? And there's many possibilities. And the same is true uh, in the science of well-being. There's not yet agreed ways either to define or to measure it. This is a new science, it's dynamic, it's in progress. And that makes it a little difficult sometimes because we think, oh, we just want something off the shelf. We want to know if the state of South Australia has improved or not improved. You know, give us, give us a good measure. But the answer is we don't have that yet, off the shelf measure. But we, we are working together as partners to work out what this good measure should be. And uh, some of the, the wonderful work that's going on uh, later that you'll hear about is contributing to that. What we need is first rate psychometrics as well uh, to understand what it is that we need to be measuring. Um, Okay, so let's just have a, a little look. This is um, a wonderful, wonderful quote. Um, Gus O'Donnell was the head of the UK Treasury for many years. And while he was head of Treasury, he organised a meeting in Treasury about well-being because he firmly believed, and, and David Cameron uh, has actually said this, um, GDP is just a means to an end and the end is well-being. And Gus so beautifully said this, if you treasure it, measure it. Wish I'd thought of that. <laughs> so we treasure well-being, we need to measure it. How is it measured? Well, very often, it's just been a question about happiness. On a scale from 0 to 10, in general, how happy do you feel? Well, that's fine. I mean, we all like to be happy, but of course, happiness is a very transient thing. It's, it's an emotion. In fact, it's designed to be transient. I, I think our emotions evolved to give us information about what's going on right now so that we know how to react and, and how to respond. So you wouldn't want to prioritize something as transient as, as an emotion, although, you know, it's nice to be happy. So um, another approach has been to measure life satisfaction, a global evaluation. And the question is something like this, all things considered, how happy are you with your life as a whole nowadays? Again, on a scale from naught to 10, where naught is completely dissatisfied and 10 is completely satisfied. Maybe you'll have a go right now. On a scale from naught to 10, how satisfied are you with your life as a whole nowadays? Okay, anyone seven or more? Oh, okay, N nearly everyone. Yeah, and, and that is one of the problems. It's a scale that, you know, it doesn't work too well, actually, because everyone gives an answer of seven or more, apart from people who are genuinely struggling. But there's other reasons why life satisfaction isn't really a good enough measure. Um, one thing is how, honestly, in the space of a few seconds, can you evaluate your life as a whole in any meaningful way and come up with a single number? Um, you might have done it one way, you might have done it a different way. What does it mean? Secondly, life satisfaction, if it changes, if it goes up, if it goes down, we don't know what's causing that. Because it, let's, it, it could go up because your experience of life is genuinely better, or it could go up because your expectations have been lowered. Okay? So it's a complete um, sort of mix, you know, mishmash of expectations and actual experience. So it's not a, a measure that we should depend on. Um, but because it's been around a long time, it's, it's okay still to use it. Okay, um, so let's look at what we do need to do. Well-being is a combination of feeling good and functioning effectively. Sorry. So we need to be looking at both these things. We need to be looking at feeling good and we need to be looking at how well people function. And of course it isn't about feeling good all the time. 
uh, our well-being would actually be impaired if we felt good all the time because there are circumstances in our lives, periods in our lives where it's entirely appropriate not to feel good, to feel sad, to feel disappointed, to be in grief, even sometimes to be angry. Um, and the key to well-being is not pushing away those negative emotions or not experiencing them, but how we manage them. And I'm going to say a bit more about that later on. So we need to be measuring both these things. And um, in the UK, they've had an attempt to do that. Um, the UK really has um, made a genuine effort to take an interest in well-being, to measure it uh, at a national level and to try and improve it. So. Um, they, they came up with these four questions. Um, the, the general question about life satisfaction, I think that's fine because it's been around so long you still need to use it if you want to compare with historical data. Then two questions about feelings, and this is based on the work of Daniel Kahneman, who's a, a Nobel laureate psychologist, although he got it in economics. Um, and, and Daniel says that you shouldn't ask generic questions about how people feel, but much more specific ones about how they felt today or yesterday. So they were influenced by that. And then they've got the one question about what we could call functioning. Uh, to what extent do you think that what you do, you do in your life is worthwhile? And, and it's great. I mean, they have, they've got some very interesting results, but of course, is that good enough? But, you know, it's a wonderful start. So let's um, have a look at the kind of results that they've been getting in the UK. So this is done um, every six months on a sample of about 160,000 people around the UK. So it allows us to look at regional variation in well-being. And the first thing we find is the very large regional variations in well-being. It turns out that the highest well-being is around the, around the edges. Uh, so Scotland, Northern Ireland and the South West have the highest levels of well-being. The lowest levels of well-being are in London uh, and the Welsh Valleys. But you can also look not just at the averages, not just at the means, but at the dispersion, at the inequalities in well-being. And I think that's a profoundly important thing to do as well. Um, and it turns out that when you do that, the highest inequalities uh, in the well-being, and of course this is all, as, I, uh, as you can see, corrected for socio-demographics, the highest inequalities in well-being are again in the Welsh Valleys and in Glasgow. Now, we need to try and understand that. We need to understand both what causes the variation in the average, but also why is it that in some places there's such inequality. So many people low in well-being and others very high, even in the same region. So I think it's very important to be looking at this very carefully. Um, and these inequalities of well-being, just to reiterate, are not linked to inequalities in income or anything else that, 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 that we've been able to measure. So coming back to this question about, you know, are those four questions enough? And I think you already know my answer. No, they're a great start, but they're certainly not enough. What more do we need to really measure well-being? Well, I think what Martin Seligman has, uh, has done is a, a big step forward. Uh, and as um, uh, Julio mentioned, there are these five uh, pillars of well-being. So, uh, and they spell out PERMA. So positive emotion, yeah, it's good to have quite a bit of it. Engagement, being really interested and involved in, in things that we do in our lives. Relationships, profoundly important. A sense of meaning or purpose in our lives. And also accomplishment, the, you know, the, the sense that, that we are uh, capable people, we are accomplishing things, um, the, and, and we can from that, of course, get a, a sense of pride. So PERMA is a very, very good step forward. But is PERMA everything? Does it cover everything? Um, there are many, many people in the field of uh, psychology who have their own list of what should be the ingredients of well-being. And there's quite a bit of overlap, but there's also differences between these lists. And uh, the lists depend upon one's own personal preferences, one's understanding of philosophy and so on. And Martin is an extraordinarily well-read man, and he's come up with these ones, uh, which you know, he, he suggests are universal. But I was wondering whether there might be a more systematic way to come up with a list of what it is we need to measure when we're looking at well-being. And uh, I worked with a student to see if we could come up with something. And the approach that we took was very much an approach from mental health. So the idea that mental health falls along this spectrum. At one end, we've got very poor mental health or ill-being 
And these are the clinically significant common mental disorders, not all mental disorders, just the, the common mental disorders. And people who don't quite meet criteria can be languishing, and then moderate mental health, and at the other end we've got flourishing. Now, at any point in our lives, we move up and down this scale. Ordinary people might at some points be flourishing, but at other points they might have an anxiety disorder or a depression. So we move up and down this scale. But here's the important thing. Uh, again, uh, Julia mentioned this already. Decades of work have gone into defining the symptoms of these common mental disorders. So we, there's a universal, I mean, international agreement on the symptoms of depression, the symptoms of anxiety. So what if we build on that work? What if we use that and define the opposite? Because well-being, quite clearly, or flourishing, isn't just the absence of ill-being, it's the opposite in this uh, illustration. So we did a very exhaustive exercise of taking all of the um, symptoms of depression, anxiety from the Diagnostic and Statistic Man Manual, DSM, from the International Classification of Diseases, the ICD, and we simply listed all the words and phrases that represented those and took the opposite. So in the case of depression, uh, as I'm sure you know, the, the major symptoms are things like loss of interest uh, and apathy, um, loss of positive affect, um, a sense of hopelessness. So we said interest, engagement, um, positive emotions, um, optimism. So we simply did this exercise as systematically as we could. And we came up with just 10 uh, um, descriptions that seem to be the opposite of those common mental disorders. And what's very interesting is that five of the 10 are very clearly PERMA. Um, actually, we tend to call it competence rather than accomplishment, but it's the same, uh, broadly speaking, the same uh, concept, the sense of uh, being competent, being capable. But there are five others, uh, the ones on the right. So there's resilience, there's emotional stability, vitality, optimism, and self-esteem. And I think they are important because let's imagine we had PERMA, but we actually didn't feel good about ourselves. There'd be something missing or we had PERMA, but when we faced challenges or difficulties, we were not resilient, we weren't able to bounce back. So I think we do need to think a bit more broadly uh, about what it is we might want to measure. And even this is not exhaustive. Um, a lot of the theories about the elements of well-being uh, talk about autonomy, the, the sense um, that we need to have some control over our lives, the sense that we have control over our lives. Um, we, we tried to find autonomy in this systematic way, but because the lack of autonomy was not mentioned as a symptom of these disorders, we couldn't put it in. But I think autonomy is something that we should probably look at and measure. Sense of empowerment, sense of control over our lives. I think another one uh, might be to do with um, determination or persistence. Um, Angela Duckworth calls it grit. Um, that's another one. So especially at this early stage in our science of well-being and in, in our measurement of well-being, I think it's absolutely crucial to be broad, to have at least these 10, possibly 12, perhaps some others. Later on, when we've measured these things well, we can do the psychometric analysis and we can see how many are actually key or how many are so closely related to each other that we don't even need to measure all of them. But until we've measured these, we will never know the answer to that. So I think definitely we do need to go broad. Now, the next thing we thought is, okay, so, so, so these are the 10 features. We'd like to come up with a, a measurement of flourishing. So just like we can um, look at the prevalence of depression, anxiety at one end, what is the prevalence of flourishing? So we, we wanted to put these together in a way that would give us a measure of flourishing. And again, we followed what had happened in psychiatry. And in the case of psychiatry, you don't have to have every single symptom of depression or anxiety. There are some core ones and, and others. So we felt that a core one here was positive affect because it's the only hedonic measure in this list. So we, we said there needs to be a reasonable amount of positive affect. And, uh, and then we did some uh, factor analysis and there were two factors. And it turned out, without getting too technical, that we also need uh, the majority of the other two. It turns out that we also need the majority of PERMA and uh, 
and the majority of the, the five, uh, that are the non-PERMA items. So we came up with that definition, an operational definition, and we thought carefully about where the cut points should go and so on. And that was our definition of flourishing. So then comes the question, can we find a data set that's measured anything like this? Because we, we didn't have the resources to do a really big nationally representative sample to test this, this out. But could we find a data set where this had been done? And we looked around at many different data sets, particularly from representative population samples. And the one that seemed to fit the bill best was something called the European Social Survey. So this is a survey that's carried out every two years uh, across Europe. Um, and there's always a core set of questions, but every two years, people are invited to add questions. So in round three, uh, we won uh, one of the bids to introduce questions, and we introduced questions about well-being. And incidentally, we have just redone this uh, in 2012-13 uh, again. So we have data from 2006-07 and 2012-13 about well-being across Europe. So we, um, we looked at the questions that we had in the European Social Survey and we picked what we thought were the best questions corresponding to each of those 10 concepts, those 10 features. Now they weren't necessarily perfect, but they were, you know, the best that we could do. Um, happiness was pretty straightforward. Uh, engagement, uh, there was a question about love of learning new things. Uh, Self-esteem, pretty straightforward. So, so a lot of them were pretty good. Some of them, if we had been designing it from scratch, we might have even done better. And uh, actually there's some better questions in the latest um, version. But we don't yet have the data available from the 2013 uh, round. Uh, part of it's available, it's still being cleaned. Um, but so I'm gonna present you the data from the pre-GFC uh, results for these different countries. So although there were 23 countries that took part in the study, uh, one country, Hungary, forgot to ask questions about vitality, so we, we had to exclude them. Okay, so this is the data on 22 countries. Um, the percentage of people who met our criterion of flourishing, and you can see that in Denmark it was extraordinarily high. Over 40% of Danes met this criterion. And generally speaking, the Nordic countries did well, and they always do. Even if you measure happiness, life satisfaction, whatever it is, the Nordic countries tend to come out very well. Eastern European countries always do badly. Um, life has been very tough since the, the, fall, the fall of communism, and that is still reflected uh, in their levels of well-being, as indeed in their levels of uh, me mental illness, alcoholism, and, and so forth. We were very surprised that the bottom country was a, a Western European country, or Southern European country, Portugal, um, but it actually turns out that uh, it, it, it does make sense. For instance, um, Portugal has the lowest level of education of all OECD countries. Um, and I don't know what it is today, but when we were measuring it here back in 2006-07, the average age of leaving school was 13 in Portugal. They had very low rates of employment even back then and huge inequalities, huge income inequalities in Portugal. Their Gini index was very large. So the difference between richest and poorest was extremely high. And um, besides, they listen to Fado all the time. So, um, <laughs> okay, France is always a puzzle uh, for the people who do these kinds of surveys because you'd expect France to do really well. They have very short working hours. They have lots of public holidays. Their commitment to leisure is, is, is famous. Of course, their wine and food is out of this world. Why do the French not do better on such measures? And I'm going to um, address that again in a moment. But they don't. They're always, you know, they're in the bottom half. Of course, the next question is, what do we know about the factors associated with this measure of flourishing? So we first looked at the individual level factors. So we took all the people in Europe who had met our criterion for flourishing, and we asked the question, what's this associated with? So we looked at um, social relationships and social trust, because there's reason to think those are important. But also, as part of the European Social Survey, they do a values inventory. It's called the Schwarz Values Inventory. Some of you may know it. And that asks people about their values. And the way it goes is something like this. Um, she is the type of person, or he is the type of person who, 
or for whom money is really important or who loves to help others and you, in, you uh, indicate the extent to which you are like or not like this, this person. So we were looking at the relationship between flourishing and uh, values. So first of all, we looked at the people who met the criterion for flourishing. Um, and yes, these were people who were socially connected and had high levels of social trust. In terms of their values, it's very interesting. They valued creativity and new ideas. They valued loyalty and you know, helping other people and they valued enjoyment of life. But we can ask the other question too, who were the people who were not flourishing? And the people who were not flourishing were the ones who valued money and status and security. And here's an interesting one, traditional religious uh, values, religious beliefs came out in the not flourishing group. Now that is completely different to the data from the US. Every study in the US shows that religious values, religious practices, religious beliefs are associated with higher levels of well-being. This isn't the only study that has found it's different in Europe. And that's why it's so important to look cross-culturally. So in Europe, which is a very secular place, broadly speaking, it's people without specific religious values and beliefs who are flourishing more. And it could be to do with this, this sort of person context fit. A lot has been written about that in social psychology. I don't know what the situation is in Australia. It'd be interesting to find out. Now, that's looking uh, at the individual level, but what about at the country level? What are the factors that determine which countries uh, are doing well? And yes, relative wealth is up there. Um, so relative wealth is a good thing, but so too is low income inequality uh, associated with better well-being. Also low unemployment, um, good healthcare system, high welfare expenditure. These are um, messages that are not particularly welcome today. Um, but these were certainly the things that, uh, that, that we found. Um, good governance, meaning not uh, a lot of corruption, and um, social trust. And actually, social trust, um, it's interesting how it's measured differently at the individual level and at the country level. So at the individual level, uh, people are just asked, you know, can you trust your neighbours or you know, can you trust people on the street? Um, whereas at the country level, what they do is experiments. Okay, what kind of experiments do they do? Well, they take a wallet full of money and drop it in city streets around the world. And the question is, do they come back? <laughs> so in some countries, the wallet and all the money is handed in, Nordic countries particularly. Uh, in some countries, the wallet is handed in. And in some countries, <laughs> so it's lovely that there's this kind of objective marker of social trust. So, so these were the things uh, at the country level that made a difference. But of course what I've done here is I've created just a single measure of flourishing based on those 10 features. But of course the beauty about having those 10, and maybe others besides, um, is that we can actually look at them separately. And again, as I, just to reiterate, at this early stage in our science, I think it's very important to do that and to look at the individual country profiles. Um, and I'm going to just show you two examples. Uh, the first is uh, France, and at the top you'll see the, um, again, a global measure, the life satisfaction measure, which is quite low, uh, only 6.4, and here is their profile across those 10 features. Now, in terms of our measure of engagement, France was uh, way up the top, so 22 is the highest rank on any one of these. Not only did they get the highest rank, but they were 80% more likely than any other country to say they love learning new things. It was quite extraordinary, a huge uh, effect there. However, they were the lowest in Europe on self-esteem, on our measure of self-esteem, and the second lowest uh, on optimism. And it could be that those things are what's bringing down their well-being. Now, I, I'm sure you're asking yourself the question, and rightly so, well, couldn't these just be cultural differences? Maybe it's just not okay in France to say you feel good about yourself. Maybe it's not cool to say you're optimistic. It might be kind of, there may be more cachet in saying, you know, oh, I think things are going to be pretty bleak, or, you know, being a bit of a skeptic. That may well be true, and of course there are cultural differences, but what if, what if those very cultural differences do the people a disservice? 
I mean, culture is not fixed in stone. Cultures can change. And if it turns out that such cultural attitudes are doing the citizens a disservice, maybe they do need to change. Now, I want to contrast France with Spain. So Spain had the highest level of self-esteem in our European sample. But they also had the lowest levels of their sense of competence and vitality. And again, this is really very important because if you were developing a policy to improve well-being in France and Spain, it would be a different policy. Okay, in France you wouldn't worry about engagement, in Spain you would, and, and so forth. So these profiles really do make a difference in terms of what we decide about policy to enhance well-being. Okay, I want to talk now about a study that was done a few years ago in the UK. Um, the um, UK Government Office for Science uh, did this thing called the Foresight Project on Mental Capital and Wellbeing. Wh why did they do it? Well, they recognised that the UK's biggest resource was its people. And if they wanted the UK to flourish, people had to flourish. So there was this wonderful two-year project. Uh, it involved 400 international experts contributing. Um, they wrote 89 state of the science reviews. Um, I was involved in a sort of overarching review on the determinants of well-being and ways to improve it. Um, and then at the end of this immense you know, process, not unlike some of the things that are happening here in South Australia, at the end of this they thought, how can we best communicate our findings to the ordinary public? You know, 89 state of the science reviews, who's going to read that? Even if it is available on you know, CDs in books on the internet, who's going to read it? So they commissioned an organisation called the New Economics Foundation to come up with the, the five ways to well-being, evidence-based. Okay, um, this is particularly meaningful in the UK because we have um, something we call five a day. Everyone in the UK knows about five a day. It's the it's the fact that you should eat five portions of fresh fruit and vegetables a day for your physical well-being. So this was the, the sort of mental equivalent of five a day. So what were the the five evidence-based actions that people could take or organisations could take to improve their well-being? Here we go. So the first one connect. I mean, our social relationships are profoundly important for our well-being. And even though we know that, we often lead such busy lives where we think, oh no, well, we won't see that friend or that relative this week, we're too busy. But connecting is profoundly important. And the next one is physical activity. So physical activity is not only important for our physical health, it's very important for our mental health. It's actually been suggested that um, um, physical activity is the best antidepressant, uh, antidepressant we have. And um, Tal Ben-Shahar, who uh, some of you may know, who's written wonderful books on happiness and taught at Harvard, he, says, he goes a step further and he says, it's not so much that physical activity is an antidepressant, it's that not being physically active is a depressant. Because our bodies evolved to be physically active. And when we're not, our physiological processes don't work uh, in the uh, efficient way that they should. So be active is profoundly important for our mental health as well. Take notice. Now this is about mindfulness. It's about being pausing in the moment to be aware of what's going on around us and what's going on inside us. So pausing to notice the passing clouds or, or the child smiling uh, on the bus. Um, but also pausing to notice that we're feeling tense or we're feeling happy or, or whatever it is. And I'm going to come back to that one. Keep learning, um, again, hugely important. And the benefits of learning are not just cognitive benefits but also the sense of mastery, um, self-esteem, uh, the fact that learning is so often uh, giving us connection with others and so forth. And finally, give. It's quite clear, and the evidence has accumulated over recent years, that although we've studied endlessly what we get from others, and there's been masses of stuff on social support and how important that is, it turns out that when you control for what you get from others, what you give to others is what's really important for your well-being. And actually not just for well-being, but there's even been studies of survival. Um, the, the chance of um, dying, the chance of staying alive, is linked not to your social support, but to what you do for others. 
even when you control for uh, illness and all, all those sorts of things. So giving is profoundly important. Um, and the one I'm going to just concentrate on now for a moment is um, that middle one, the take notice or the mindfulness. And the reason is, I'm going to argue that mindfulness is um, not just another intervention. I mean, there are many wonderful interventions to improve our well-being. And of course, the whole point about measuring well-being is to show what's happening to it and where possible to improve it. Okay? So there are many wonderful interventions to improve well-being, you know, around gratitude, around savouring, about use of character strengths, about flexible mindsets, many wonderful things. What I'm going to suggest is mindfulness training is not just another intervention. It's actually fundamental to any of them. It's fundamental to our well-being. And the reason is that mindfulness training is training in awareness itself how to be aware and all of these other things are going to benefit from our increased awareness. So um, let's have a, a quick look at mindfulness training and I'm going to present a bit of data mostly from two specific programs. Mindfulness based stress reduction MBSR developed by John Kabat-Zinn, a scientist at the University of Massachusetts Medical Center or mindfulness-based cognitive therapy, which is really very, very similar, but just has a little bit more of the, the CBT in it. Now, what, what do these do? Well, first of all, what is mindfulness? It's just a way of paying attention to what's going on right now, just pausing. I mean, we, we lead such busy, frantic lives, you know, running helter-skelter from one meeting to the next, answering phones, emails, Facebook, Twitter, whatever it is. We are so busy. And this is just a way of pausing and stopping and paying attention. Um, and a very important thing about it is it's paying attention in a non-judgmental way. We're so good at judging ourselves and finding ourselves wanting. This is not judging. We may have a, a nasty thought and we may go straight to, oh God, I must be a horrible person because I've had this nasty thought. No, it's just a nasty thought. We're not judging, we're just noticing. With curiosity, with interest, we're just noticing what's going on for us, what's going on in our experience. And it has the effect of quieting the mind and creating clarity. And as a result, we make better decisions and better choices. So what are some of the um, specific things that are benefited uh, from this um, mindfulness training? So um, sensory awareness. We, we do, when we pause and look at our experience, become aware of the lovely things that are happening to us. It could be the smell of the coffee, but you know, many other wonderful things. We pause, we savour. Um, for instance, mindful eating is a, is a wonderful practice. Um, really noticing what you're eating, using all your senses. I don't know, some of you may have done the raisin exercise. You're given a humble raisin, and first of all, you just look at it. And, and it's an extraordinary object when you do that, the way it's pitted and, and the different concavities and convexities and the way the light shines off it. It's, it's amazing. And smell it. I don't know how many people have smelt a raisin. The texture, the texture of it on your hand, it's really extraordinary. And only after a while do you even put it in your mouth and you don't, don't even bite then. You just notice the texture on your tongue, what's happening to salivary glands, and eventually bite into it. And that experience, and I do invite you to try it if you haven't, that experience is just overwhelming. That burst of sweet flavour is just amazing. So we can bring that experience to all our eating. And, and you know, lovely Austro uh, you know, wine from the Adelaide Hills as well. It's all enhanced through mindfulness. And in fact, I would suggest, and there is some evidence, um, that the obesity epidemic could be in part alleviated if people were taught mindful eating. So not eating, you know, just guzzling, just throwing the stuff in, but actually pausing. Because when you do eat mindfully, you eat less. Because each morsel is so delicious, you kind of just need less of it. Okay, so the sensory awareness, but also um, the, the negatives. So one of the things mindfulness is very good with is physical pain. Um, because often when we're in physical pain, when we have this unpleasant sensory experience, we, we tighten up, we, 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 we get very tense, we try and reject it. 
Whereas with mindfulness, what we do is we treat it with interest and curiosity. And we notice that pain changes. It's not the same, it's not static, it does move. We notice exactly where it is, how it's ebbing and flowing. You know, this bit is like a knife and that bit is slumped something else, more like an ache. So we notice it with curiosity. It's not that the pain goes away, it's just that our relationship to the pain alters. We can be more curious about it and also we can recognise that maybe our thought has gone to, oh, I'm always going to have this pain, I will never be without pain, I am a person in pain. That's just a thought, okay? And we just notice that thought. Um, okay, so then the next thing is attention itself. Um, mindfulness training, often focusing on the breath, just noticing the breath coming and going, is a wonderful way to focus our attention because our minds wander, that's just what minds do. But we can train ourselves to recognise that our mind has wandered and bring it back, and bring it back, bring it back a thousand times, but we learn how to do that. And we learn both how to focus our attention with techniques like that, but also, where appropriate, to broaden our attention. And there's some wonderful um, trainings within MBSI and BCT of open awareness. So something like a listening meditation where you just sit, perhaps with eyes closed, and just notice all the sounds going on around you. And it's a most wonderful um, thing to do. So then cognitive control, um, very important, because I already mentioned this, the idea that thoughts are just thoughts. I mean, we sometimes get terribly stuck in our thoughts and our beliefs, but recognising A, that we're having them, and B, that they don't have to be like that is very important. You know, that, that thought about, I'm not good enough, I can't, I won't, I'm going to fail. Recognising it's just a thought, but also knowing that the more often we have that thought, the stronger will be the brain pathways that underline it. Well, um, that are activated when we have that thought. And if we change that thought, if we say something like, well, maybe it'll be okay, I'll, I'll have a go, well, you know, maybe I won't do so well, but that's okay, then not only do those brain pathways start to get stronger, but the next time we meet a difficulty or a challenge, they are more likely to come to the fore. So the cognitive control is very important. Emotion regulation, hugely important. Recognising the emotions that we're having is the first step towards controlling them, towards managing them. So instead of just being angry and lashing out, noticing, oh, OK, I'm feeling angry right now. And that gives us a choice about how to respond. And finally, the thing I've already mentioned, um, acceptance or non-judgment. So being kind to ourselves, and there's some evidence, I don't know if I have time to talk about it, but that, that also leads to being kinder to others. We find it very hard in the West very often to be kind to ourselves, but it is profoundly important. And I was just mentioning um, earlier to Rhonda that there's some very beautiful work uh, being done uh, on d depression, recurrent depression. Uh, uh, mindfulness training now, by the way, is in the uh, NHS guidelines in the UK as a first line treatment for recurrent depression. So um, one of the research questions was, look, mindfulness does a whole range of things. Which of these is having the effect? And you can unpack it. Uh, and Mark Williams, um, a professor at Oxford in the Oxford Mindfulness Centre, has done some very elegant and beautiful randomised control trials unpacking which elements of mindfulness lead to a reduction in uh, depression uh, recurrence. And it turns out that the most important ingredient uh, is self-compassion. So the people who learned to be kinder to themselves were the ones who were less likely to go on having the depression. The ones who didn't learn that but learned other things, they kept on having depression. So it is very important. Um, okay, just, just a, a, a few things about, um, about this. There are many misunderstandings about mindfulness and I, I think we really do need to address them. One of them is mindfulness and meditation are the same thing. Now there is a big overlap, but you can be mindful without meditating, and I believe you can meditate without being mindful. What about mindful without meditating? Well, let's imagine you, you're going into a big meeting, and maybe the normal thing you would do is check out the agenda and think, oh yeah, that's where I've got to make my point, and oh, I bet he's going to say that, and what am I going to say? Or you can go into that meeting in a mindful way and sit and notice the way people are behaving, who, how they're moving, who's sitting, what, what their facial expressions are like, and very importantly, 
what you're feeling, what's going on inside you, is there a tension in your stomach, are you feeling irritable, and so on. And when you become aware of what's going on around and inside, that meeting is likely to go better. It's likely to be less confrontational, more collaborative, and so forth. So you can be mindful without meditating. You can be mindful any time, right now, in a meeting, anywhere. Um, and I think there are forms of meditation which are not particularly mindful, which are really about blocking thoughts rather than noticing thoughts. Um, so, so that's one of the things. Also, I don't think that all present-mindedness is mindful, because there are times where people are very much in the present, perhaps because they've got a terrible problem, because they're, they're, they're suffering and they're very present-focused. But that doesn't mean they're mindful. They're not necessarily aware, they're not reflecting. So not all present-mindedness uh, is, is mindful. And the final thing is, <laughs> some people seem to have the idea that if mindfulness is good, we should do it all the time. Well, of course not. Of course we can't be present all the time, it would be silly. And it's very important sometimes to be focused on the past. Uh, so for example, um, uh, reflecting on experiences we've had in the light of new insights that we've gained, that can be a very important and helpful thing to do. Or in the future, planning, um, imagining, the sort of things that Martin Seligman and his colleagues are now talking about, prospection. Those are really, really important things to do. And of course we mustn't be in the moment all the time. Um, but even prospection, um, which uh, Seligman acknowledges, is in the present. I mean, there's a very real sense in which the future never arrives. So even prospection, thinking about the future, imagining future possible scenarios, is a present moment representation of possibilities. And I might suggest that if we're mindful of those imaginings, uh, if we're mindful of how we're evaluating those imaginings in order to make decisions, I think that can only be of benefit. And there's not really time to talk about creativity, but I think it's very important. And just to say that one lovely way of looking at creativity from uh, a guy in the UK called Guy Claxton um, is the idea um, of creativity as thinking at the edge. It's those hazy, pre-conscious ideas that we often just dismiss. But if we're mindful, we can actually notice those hazy ideas and think, oh, actually that's quite an interesting possibility. And then we can evaluate them and uh, that may lead to creativity and innovation. Okay, um, I don't know if you've seen this cover of Time magazine. There's a mindful revolution. It's extraordinary what's been happening to mindfulness. Um, a few years ago, if I, if I gave a, a talk and mentioned mindfulness, the majority of people had never heard of it. And now it's very rare that people are not quite familiar with it. And I just wanted to say something about what's happening in the UK. In Parliament. In Parliament, my colleagues uh, have been running sessions for MPs and peers, members of the House of Lords. They've been running standard mindfulness-based stress reduction courses. They've already completed three, they're into their fourth. There is such an interest and such a demand. Standard eight-week courses, hour and a half, uh, two hours a week. In between the third and the fourth course, they decided to put on a, a course for staff members, those who support the MPs and the peers. And they put it online. Within three minutes, it was fully subscribed. It's absolutely extraordinary what's happening. There's now an all-party parliamentary group that's just been set up, I think, this week uh, on mindfulness. And there is real interest across departments in education, in health. Um, the, I spoke of the Department for Communities and Local Government. They were really, really interested, really keen. Um, so there is a, a, a great interest in the possibilities. Why is that? Look, I think again it comes back to these very stressful, frantic lives that we lead and the sense that we, are, we need something a bit more peaceful. We need some downtime. Um, but perhaps there's also um, a spiritual component um, because if you are mindful, say, in a beautiful landscape or whatever, you get a, this wonderful sense of, of awe, connection and, and so forth. So I think... Uh, so just very briefly, um, a lot of evidence about the benefits of mindfulness for a range of things, depression, anxiety, eating disorders, pain, uh, and it has, uh, the processes seem to be increasing positive affect, decreasing negative, um, but there's also these effects on sleep quality, fatigue, um, empathy, and uh, immune and endocrine uh, function. There's a very lovely study uh, that was done on brain structure 
is it possible that our brain structure, well we know brain structures can change, but how quickly can they do it? So this was a study of a standard eight week course looking at brain structure using MRI before and after the course. And they predicted which areas would change based on what we know about cross-sectional associations uh, in the past. And they indeed found after just eight weeks there were measurable changes in the brain areas subserving these different components of mindfulness. In fact, there was only one region uh, that didn't show a significant effect, but you know, eight weeks isn't that long a time. And of course, uh, we, we know about functional changes uh, as well, uh, that you can show those over after an eight week course. And uh, this lovely classical study where uh, groups were randomised to a MBSR or waitlist control group and at the end of the eight weeks both groups were given a flu vaccine. And the question was what was the, um, how good was the immunity as a result of the flu vaccine. And this is a measure of the antibody response to the flu vaccine and it was significantly higher in the mindfulness group compared to the other group. Now we know that stress levels influence your immune function and how you respond to a flu vaccine. And it's very likely that the MBSR mindfulness based stress reduction course did what it says on the tin, reduce stress. And that may well have accounted for this difference. But these are, these are very real effects. And I think one of the important reasons why mindfulness has become of such interest around the world to policymakers, parliamentarians, whoever, health service, uh, education and elsewhere, is because it's underpinned by this really outstanding neuroscience. So just a very little bit um, about mindfulness and education. Now, there's a lot of educators here, I, I, I noticed, and our traditional approach to education was to teach children the skills and knowledge they need about the outer world. And that has led to a curriculum of content. But what if we actually taught them to cultivate the mind itself? So that's one of the ideas of introducing mindfulness into education. It's about cultivating the mind itself, cultivating attention and awareness, cultivating self-regulation, cultivating self-kindness. These are very important things. What's the evidence? Um, so there, there was a, a very nice uh, systematic review a few years ago and they keep coming up all the time, very encouraging findings. Um, now, just to say that not all these studies are great, a lot of them are just pre-post, some of them have comparison groups, some don't, not many RCTs yet, um, but the results keep on showing uh, these kinds of benefits. So there's benefits for cognitive skills, academic, social skills, um, benefits for emotion regulation, self-esteem, uh, and then also the increased positive, decreased negative. I'm going to talk about one particular project that was mentioned uh, by Gabrielle at the beginning and it's something that we developed in the UK um, and it's called the Mindfulness in Schools project. Uh, I worked on it with a couple of uh, uh, very inspired teachers who took the adult training, the MBSR, but changed it in such a way that it became really attractive uh, for adolescents. And there are many wonderful things using video clips, using all sorts of games, experiences and so on. And the adolescents certainly find it very engaging. And one of the things that they were allowed to do was pair up with a buddy and once a day send each other this message. That's the text message that they got. Dot, stop, the, breathe. <laughs> and when you received this text message, that's what you had to do, just stop and breathe. And adolescents loved it. They just love permission to be still, permission to be in their busy days. And the whole program is now called Dot B. Um, and one of the things we found in the very first pilot study was it's not enough to learn uh, Dot B, to learn this mindfulness curriculum, you have to practice it. No surprises really. I mean, imagine if we learned all about swimming but never actually practiced swimming. Um, so uh, this just shows that uh, if we divide the, the group up into how much practice they've done, the more practice, the greater the benefits, significant effects here, uh, the greater the benefits on a measure of well-being, a measure of resilience and m mindfulness itself. Um, that was a relatively small study, only 150 odd, but we've gone on recently to publish a much larger feasibility study. Um, this wasn't again random assignment, but we had, um, uh, there, there were about 12, 12 schools I think in six uh, teachers who'd learned the mindfulness curriculum uh, taught it, 
uh, to their class and then or, or to, to the year level and then other schools were matched as closely as possible in terms of socio-demographics, urban, rural and also academic achievement. Um, so um, the randomization, uh, it wasn't random, sorry, the, the comparison was between different kinds of schools. Not perfect, but you know, not bad uh, as a feasibility study. And what did we find? What we're looking at here is the differences between the intervention schools and the control schools right after the end of the training and then three months later when they were about to do their exams. So first of all, um, our well-being measure. Uh, it was, uh, I think we used the Warwick Edinburgh Mental Wellbeing Scale, which is a really well-validated scale on representative population samples. So, well-being increased uh, after this uh, experience compared to the controls. Didn't quite reach statistical significance, but there was quite a large increase. Symptoms of depression significantly decreased, and that's very important as well. What happened at the three-month point? No further training. Well-being went up even higher and was now significant and depression remained significant. So even three months later there was an increase, a further increase in well-being and reduction in the symptoms of depression. And we were very encouraged by this. We've now submitted um, to a, a big UK uh, medical charity, the Wellcome Trust, to do a really large definitive uh, randomised control trial. And uh, we're going to hear pretty soon if we've got through the, the preliminary uh, stage. And I'm, I'm very excited to say that we're also, my new institute uh, of positive psychology and education and I are planning to do a similar thing uh, in Australia. And we're currently looking for partners who might be interested in taking part uh, in such a study. So um, there's a lot of mindfulness happening in schools, um, more and more, but we still do need to do those definitive studies before it's rolled out um, everywhere. But it's happening in other places. Um, the US Marines have been taught mindfulness, um, both to help them with reduce stress, anxiety, uh, PTSD, but also to help them with calm and focus uh, on the battlefield. Um, a lot of sporting organisations, uh, some of the big um, US uh, basketball uh, um, uh, teams are using mindfulness. I, I know that here it's happening in Australia with some of the football teams. So um, within sport, coaches are more and more aware of the benefits of becoming very present and noticing what's happening uh, in oneself and then doing amazing um, performances. And of course, it's also being used in organisations. Uh, these are just some of the early adopters. Um, Google has been using it since 2007 because they believe uh, that it really does improve creativity, team working, uh, innovation and so forth and many other, in fact it's almost easier these days to put up a slide of the organisations that aren't doing it. Um, they're not usually evaluated and also the motivation might not be necessarily the best. I think they're doing it in an instrumental way to improve, you know, the bottom line but nevertheless it's getting, it's getting in there and I think the potential is, is quite great. So there's a, a wonderful book that was published uh, by a colleague in Cambridge, The Mindful Workplace, which I would recommend especially to the people here in organisations. Um, in the US, uh, a congressman, Tim Ryan, published this book called Mindful Nation, which I think is of particular interest um, to the South Australian government. And he gave a copy of this book to every single member of Congress and every member of the Senate. Now, you may think, did it make a difference? Don't know. And of course, giving a book is one thing, doing a course is another, but practice is everything. <laughs> Actually having the experience and, and doing the practice, that's what really matters. And I think that's why what's going on in the UK Parliament is so interesting, that it's those, the parliamentarians asking for it. Uh, that I think is such a hopeful thing. Uh, just to mention about a book that came out just last week, um, Interventions and Policies to Enhance Wellbeing, I'm a co-editor, um, and it's part of a series. Uh, that, the whole series came out last week. It's called Wellbeing, a Complete Reference Guide. And it's got terrific volumes uh, on economics and wellbeing, on the environment and wellbeing, ageing and wellbeing, and so forth. So I, um, I recommend that to you. And finally, implications for policy. Well, first of all, coming back to the issue about measurement, um, I think it's very important. So um, we need to measure what matters. And as um, Julia said, um, 
if we don't measure the right thing, we won't do the right thing. So it is profoundly important. But we need to recognise that wellbeing is multidimensional and at this new stage in our science we need to measure all those dimensions. Later on maybe we'll collapse them into fewer, but we do need to measure them. And then this important thing about the group differences, whether they're national, regional or whatever, those tell us both about what perhaps determining, influencing well-being, but also appropriate policies for those uh, regions or nations. And what I've been arguing is that um, mindfulness is foundational to well-being, so it really is something that we do need to, to teach. And what I'd like to see happening is, coming back to this idea of the mental health spectrum, we put in an enormous amount of resource into helping people at the bottom end. Quite right. We should. Those people are suffering. And it's absolutely right that we should be helping them. But the thing is that because these common mental disorders are a condition that can happen to any one of us, even if we shift those people to the right, there'll be more people where they come from who come from the general population. And we'll never make a difference to reducing the prevalence of the common mental disorders. Now this is, um, I'm referring now to the work of a brilliant epidemiologist called Geoffrey Rose. And one of the things he showed is that the prevalence of any common condition, whether it's heart disease, um, alcohol abuse, gambling, whatever it is, is related to the population mean of the underlying risk factors, or in this case, the underlying uh, resources. So if you imagine, um, that the mean of this curve was shifted to the left, you'd get many more people with the depression and anxiety. And this could happen, uh, for instance, with terrible bushfires in a community, uh, or a tsunami, or a war. The whole, popula the whole curve could be shifted to the left, and you'd get many more people with those mental health problems. But what happens if we are able to shift the curve the other way? And the extraordinary thing is that even, and the epidemiological evidence is very clear, even a tiny shift in the mean, in the average of this curve, can lead to a profound shift in the reduction of the common disorder. So you can see how the common disorder could be greatly reduced by a very small shift in the average. And there'd be also a very large increase in flourishing. So I think it's very helpful to take this sort of population perspective, look at the whole population, the way we can improve things for the whole population. And just to conclude, my, uh, my goal for policy <laughs> is to uh, ensure that as many people as possible are flourishing and actually for as much of the time as possible. And that includes developing their full creative potential, being mindful of themselves and others and contributing to a thriving community. Thank you.